Hello everyone and welcome back to my Mars colonization series in Kerbal Space Program 1.6.1. In this episode I'm gonna do one final launch for Mars and then we're gonna manage all the business of getting the vehicles to their destination. And in the comments you guys suggested quite a number of different things uh, that I should launch. Uh, an additional scanner combined with a relay communication package, a ground-based reactor for future base power generation, um, a car, and uh, a plane to Mars for fun's sake. Um, uh, increased communication coverage was also a suggestion there. More ore scanning satellites that's covered by the by the um, additional scanner suggestion. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. So, uh, the, as far as the ground-based reactor is concerned, I'm going to try and model one based on Krusty or um, the kilopower system that uh, NASA is trying to create. And so I'll probably have my own model for that and we'll launch it in the next window because I need time to actually do the Blender modeling. But um, so yeah, that won't be going this time. Though I did add something to this payload that will be at least a taste of that, if you will. So what I came up with was, well, this. Uh, big fairing little payload here. Uh, but that's because of the width. Uh, so I just combined everything into one thing. <laughs> um, so we've got a Tesla Roadster. Uh, it's not red because white seems to go better with everything else. And uh, so that's the car. Uh, I don't think it could actually fly. Uh, we would have to design quite a... Uh, how to design a plane for Mars is complicated because we can't... Even though we can reduce the gravity on uh, Earth using the cheats we can't really reduce the air pressure so we basically have to sort of test it on Mars uh, cheat it over there to test the plane and so that's a complicated business I don't want to get into uh, so yeah uh, it's a Tesla Roadster this is part of the auto garage pack if you haven't seen that it comes with a lot of cars this is one of them I deleted the rest of the cars and uh, they do work they have a little engine you have to turn the engine on once you get outside and it does have a, a color switcher uh, so yeah I'm just going with the white and black here and I just quickly put the wing pieces just for the heck of it hey you said it was for fun and um, extra comms right okay you didn't realize how big that comm dish was and I actually tweak skilled it down Tesla Roadsters are really small and I don't think I would fit very well in one but uh, anyway that's uh, neither here nor there uh, I mentioned that uh, a little taste of a ground based reactor well we've got an RTG so there you are. Um, other than that, we've got a scanner here. I don't know if this will all work very well, but hey, I don't even know if it's properly balanced. We've got all these ED5 packs. Uh, these were uh, slapped onto the lander to give it more thrust. So we've got two of the ED5 engines there, and uh, two here and two here. Basically, they're like Super Draco packs, uh, except they're methane and oxygen. And then we've got a whole bunch of RCS thrusters. I finally configured the standard RCS so that it can use methane and oxygen. So we've got methane and oxygen there. It's sort of like a little shuttle sort of, sort of situation or if you uh, watched Top Gear, the Reliant Robin shuttle that they made, sort of a miniature version of that. Uh, and we've also got fuel in this thing though that's not a whole lot of fuel. It's like 14 seconds it says here. We do have fuel cross feeding, we've got fuel line but the priority is for this tank first. And yeah, so I think that covers everything. <laughs> uh, well, first time I'm launching something this ridiculous, but it look it doesn't look too bad when you think about it. You know, uh, I have managed to make it a nice, neat little tight package, and it satisfies all the stated requirements. So there you are. Uh, we are launching on. Uh, Sajita Super Heavy, which is the equivalent launch capability as a Falcon Heavy. I thought about just using the Sajita Heavy because, you know, that would look more like a uh, Falcon Heavy even though it doesn't have the payload capacity, but the payload capacity was so far off that I don't think we could have gotten all this to Mars. If we were just sending a Tesla Roadster, that it could do easily, of course. But, uh, yeah, they had lots of margin on that test. Anyway, so... I guess we'll package it up, make sure that there's no crew on board. Very important. It, does, it should have a, 
uh, controller, though maybe I'll sneak another one under the nose cone here just for safety's sake. And um, control orientation, I'm not entirely sure how I'd be oriented with the car's controller. And yep, then we will launch. Okay, well I'm time warping so that we line up with the moon as I normally do. And that seems to work out fine for our transfers. But I noticed this core overheating shutting down thing. Now, I'm presuming that's the RTG on board. Uh, otherwise, it would presumably specify that it was some other vehicle. Though obviously, I'm concerned about my reactors on the other vessels. I, I'm guessing it's just the RTG. I didn't think that they would do that. Core overheating? Do RTGs have core overheating? I don't know. And why would it be overheating here out of all places? So that's a concern. <laughs> Remember to disable that atmospheric autopilot and let's see how it works. That core overheating shutting down thing is just gonna be up there the whole time, isn't it? <laughs> uh... Oh, I mismanaged the roll situation. Uh, it'll be fine, it'll be fine, it's okay. Well... Hmm. I probably should have put some supplementary solar panels on this, shouldn't I have? I was a little bit too uh, certain of the RTG, I think. Uh, we also have a disappearing... Uh, I, I think maybe the Tesla Roadster may be a disappearing thing. Yeah, the, in previous videos I've noticed that, not in this series I don't think, like with the Vega rocket and a few other things, um, if you have a certain part, it causes a whole bunch of stuff to disappear. So if that's right, then the Tesla Roadster probably just, just disappeared. Is that right? If it's the part that's causing it. I think so. Well, now we have an RTG that's uh, not quite operating properly and an invisible Tesla Roadster. A lot of other, I mean, it caused some of the parts attached to it to go invisible, like my ED5 pack, but not some of the other parts, like the, like the RCS thrusters or the RTG. The RTG is still just floating there, but it did cause the additional tank to disappear, though not the nose cone tank. It's so weird. See, that tank is still visible, and of course, it caused the body of the rocket to disappear but not these separatrons or the side boosters. That is such a peculiar thing. I mean, I've seen it happen, so I'm not entirely surprised, but... Well, so much for the car that's a plane, that's a communication satellite scanner. Well, I mean, it's still there. I guess it's just stealth now. Well, that's another thing to add to the list of qualities it has. The stealth. Car, plane, communication satellite, resource scanner with an RTG, and what, what else was there? <laughs> all the things. It's all the things. I mean, technically I already sent a car over to Mars. That was the Packrat rover. I mean, granted, you know, it's not... It's not a Tesla Roadster. Okay, we have core ignition. You know, the invisible core. I don't know if we'll get plumes out of it. We'll see. Okay, we have separation and we do have plumes. Actually, the engines are still visible. So that's good. Actually, uh, not all the engines. There's five. Uh, the center engine is not visible. <laughs> Figure that one out, would you? If you have some theories. There are supposed to be five engines here. There are five engines here. But the center one is invisible. 
Yep. Welcome to Kerbal Space Program. <laughs> and mind you, uh, you know, the body and the engines were created by me. There's no special uh, module or something funny about them. They're generally done the same way. Okay, we have fairing separation that, uh, well, we peeked in the fairings, so we knew what we we're gonna get here. Occurs to me reaching the antenna I'm supposed to deploy is gonna be a little bit tricky, right? Because I can't see it. It's somewhere on there. Uh, actually, it's in front of the RTG. There it is. Ah, uh, we're in space. Let me extend. Well, I guess it's extended. It also has uh, two Omni antennae uh, close to the vertical stabilizers. But, no, oh, I just accidentally got one, alright. Uh, I didn't think I was going to be able to extend one of those. Well, we got one. I think I don't think I've got much of a shot. No, oh, there it is. <laughs> Just as I say, I don't think I can get the antenna. I've got it, but still, we've got this core overheating problem. Mind you, it didn't disappear before the core overheating it disappeared after. We could stop this RTG. I don't know if it's actually stopped. says inactive. I actually don't know if this is going to have enough power to get there, but given its current state, I don't know if I want it to. Well, this should be an interesting looking stage separation. Do you suppose if I went away and came back to it, it would uh, appear? We'll have to check. Okay, first stage separation. <laughs> Second stage ignition. Wow, we have a lot of extra Delta V in the stage. Uh, like I said, I, I think I could have probably used the um, Sajita Heavy. Okay, so we've got the right ISP and everything. I hope it's not drawing. Oh, it's drawing from these, that's why. Okay, we need to stop it from doing that. I thought it was a little bit suspicious how much Delta V there was. Okay. That's still more than enough to get us to Mars, of course. 5,000. But, alright, let me go to the tracking station and come back and see if it appears. Okay, good news, it's back. It is visible. Bad news, the core overheating thing is still on. So now it's it's uh, got 0 0.02 electric charge consumption, which if we ditch this stage, I think is all right. Though I would have liked to keep it hang out here so that uh, we could use its fuel for like part of the capture on Mars and all. Though I think we have enough up here to capture on Mars just fine. But uh, yeah, maybe not to a good scanning altitude. That's the rub. But, yeah, I think this upper stage takes 50 watts right now. And so that would leave us with good electric charge, I think. But I don't understand why the RTG just isn't behaving properly. And we've got this core overheating thing. Again, it says inactive. It gives an option to stop, though, which is confusing. And I don't know what's going on. Let's double check about any sort of null ref or anything. No, everything looks nice and colorful. Um, I'll clear input locks for the heck of it. And that doesn't do anything. All right, I'm just going to plot for Mars and see what happens. Okay, at some point, uh, one of the comments was that I should drop the HUD so that you can enjoy the view. So here's the view, though. I sort of wish I had rotated the car around the right way around, but yeah. 
It's a bit awkward though. <laughs> this is not the most picturesque payload. It's has the virtue of being unique. I guess we could roll it. Okay, I'll try and stabilize. You'll have to get your screenshots quick because I'm gonna be uh, needing to do that burn soon. Okay, opportunity one, and then I'll zoom in a bit. Uh, let's see. There aren't a whole lot of great angles on this. I guess that would be the best balance right there. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think we should go core overheating, though. Don't know what to do about that. Let's sell the fuel down. Okay, and ignition. Okay, we are on escape, and whoa, whoa, uh, it's a little bit imbalanced here. Uh, I'm not gonna chase that. We'll just do a correction. Okay, so since this is a scanner, I decided that we would put it into a polarish orbit, and so that's the correction I've got here, and we need to do that right now. Well, it's close. We can get closer. But we're eventually gonna have... Uh, to separate from the stage so that we can get our electric charge. Really regret not putting solar panels on somewhere. I mean, why not have the solar city package on while we're at it? Okay. And well, separation should produce some impulse, so we'll hold it right there. Who knows if it's going to be balanced once I do this, but we'll find out. It's a shame to dump all this fuel, though. Well, that didn't happen the way I wanted it to. Okay, but that did. And we are getting electric charge back, so the... RTG must be working despite this core overheat thing and the fact that it says that it's inactive because there's no other source of power as far as I can tell. It's so confusing, but this was weird to begin with. This does have uh, this Delta Avionics package drawing power. Not so much power that it would overwhelm the RTG, mind you. Okay, well... Uh, well, we've got we've got a mission that's gonna work, ish, maybe. That's a lot more delta v than I was thinking. This had two thousand seven hundred. That's that's quite a quite a lot. Um, whether we can get all that out of it is a separate question because again of the balance issues. And it turns out that our separation worked just fine. Uh, yep, that was a good separation as far as getting our orbit close to Mars without doing another correction burn. So I think we'll just go ahead and pay attention to this once it arrives instead of doing a mid-course adjustment. Okay, so adding that alarm. Appreciating its continued visibility and we don't really need to check on its power situation in sunlight because it's just an RTG. I'll deploy that, and it's good to go. <laughs> uh, okay, well, maybe we should get a, a vanity shot of it. I don't know if it's orientation. We could, wow, that's choppy. I probably need to restart this. Either that or there's something wrong with... Uh, oh, no, it disappeared. Well, I guess there must be something wrong with it if it's going to randomly disappear on us like that. Hmm. Just, uh, it's got, is it a shader issue because it got into sunlight or something? And what's up with the time warp choppiness with it? Anyway, it's bizarre, but we'll leave it be for now. Okay, so now we're going to shepherd our missions already underway. Ten missions out to Mars, one mission coming back. Uh, that mission coming back we have to pay attention to. It's 43 days. But mainly right now, I need to just focus on this uh, MTV-2, the one with our crew. 
Okay, we are doing the very, very, very last bit of what has been a long ion engine burn with Mars Transfer Vehicle 2. And it's taken since the last bit I recorded, about 27 days. And uh, here we are. We've got not only an encounter, but we're uh, closing the gap. I'm trying to get it down to that periapsis. And the difference is 0.1 meters per second, but well, with ion engines, even that takes some time warping. So let's do that. You can see how much our delta V has diminished. Okay, that's good enough. Ah, uh, lower throttle because uh, just for precision. And uh, yep, 3000 meters per second left in the ion engines only. Um, we've reserved enough methane and oxygen to capture around Mars. So this 3000 is just the amount that we need to get back home. Though we could probably uh, ease our capture requirements by boosting our, our orbit up once we get to high orbit. So once we get, uh, well, basically right outside Mars encounter zone, we should start boosting up and then we could probably save ourselves some of the methane and oxygen. I expect that we'll probably have more delta V once we get around here because, uh, uh, that's not what I wanted to do, uh, because we will have diminished our food and oxygen loads, especially the food. The water we're recycling, so I don't think we'll diminish that very much. Unless things go wrong. So let's say uh, in 165 days, we'll, we'll have an encounter in around 200 days. So this is definitely taking its time. And what I want to see is if I boost the orbit up, will it uh, mess up our approach, right? And also, is there any benefit? Is there enough benefit to justify it? So if I add maneuver here, we can see that currently A very loose capture uh, takes about a thousand meters per second. Okay, this seems to be a roughly compatible approach. Taking longer to get there because we're effectively slowing down by doing the initial burn. Uh, that's not quite as efficient, but okay. Let me just see how much methane and oxygen we have. Okay, so it looks like right now we have 1,200 meters per second in just the methane oxygen bit. We've I've shut down the ion engines, so that's how much we've got there. And then the ion engines have 3,000 more. So one way or another, we'll be able to handle this and uh, handle the transfer back. And probably we could do it without the supply vessel, though maybe I'll consider having the supply vessel transfer some supplies over. We'll see. Um, I would like to do it without that, but if it comes down to it's looking really close, I'm not going to take any chances when there are Kerbals on board, right? So, I'm going to add uh, MTV2's uh, maneuver here, this 376, and we'll be expecting to need to do uh, 770 meters per second once we actually reach Mars, plus some ion engine bonus. But, uh, yeah, let me shut down the methane here. Capturing on the Earth side should not take a whole lot. Exiting Mars is a question whether we can get by with just you know, 3,000. That's, But we are capturing into a loose orbit initially, so it sort of depends on the direction of the exit trajectory in relation to that loose orbit. So next up will be the mid-course adjustments for all the missions. Okay, actually, before we get to our mid-course adjustments, we have to take care of Mars Transfer Vehicle 1, which is doing its 500 meter per second burn so that it can return back to Earth. And I really wish it didn't, wouldn't use too much RCS here, because we need that methane and oxygen to do the capture around Earth, and, but I sort of also want to turn it so that the panels are facing the sun properly. Anyway, um, the Xenon engines are on. So I'll just begin this. We're 16 days ahead of the node, but of course we need some time to do it. We'll see how the first day goes and judge by that. 
and I'll come back to you after the burn. Okay, we're doing the last little bit of this correction and we certainly have an earth approach, but we're looking decidedly polar, which is not ideal. I mean, it's not strictly necessary for it to be in line with the moon. I just don't want to have to plot uh, Mars ejection from polar orbit. And of course, getting to polar orbit is a little bit more annoying. Not a huge amount more annoying, but a little bit more annoying if we want to send supplies up to it and everything. So, yeah. Uh, we'll probably want to correct that along with uh, the ion engine burns prior to entering Earth SOI. So right before entering Earth SOI, we'll do some ion engine stuff and try and uh, flip this a little bit, I think. I think I'm going to hold it right there. Now, of course, during this time while I've been working with uh, Mars Transfer Vehicle 1, uh, Mars Transfer Vehicle 2, the water has been cons uh, being consumed because the recycler doesn't work while we are not focused on it. So, well, but we had allowance for that. So right now I'm going to plot the correction before we enter Earth SOI so that we have that plotted and in the curve alarm clock. And then I'll be following along with Mars Transfer Vehicle 2 until this 36-day uh, mid-course adjustment for Mars Tug 2. Uh, so far, as far as alerts are concerned, we got uh, some warnings about Mars super lander on the Cassay rocket that it had battery power. It should have really huge solar panels. So um, I expect that when we turn back to it, it will recharge pretty quickly. Uh, other than that, it's been all right. We do have these, uh, well, on the Mars Transfer Vehicle 2, we now have the reactor. And same for the supply vessel. So those will have continuous power. And uh, presumably so will the Roadster. Anyway... So let me do the plot for this, and then we'll, uh, I'll meet you back when I have to do the mid-course adjustment for Mars Tug 2. Okay, we're here with Mars Tug 2, and I'm doing the burn with RCS. So it's going to take a little bit of time, but that does give us the opportunity to check on our crew, if I can find Mars Transfer Vehicle 2 in that list. Um, we can see that so far 9% stress and 3% radiation basically across the board for Sigber, Jamie, Jedcast, and Ribbon. And um, basically they've been out for a little bit longer than the time we have here, so more than 90 days. That's a little bit worrisome because I know that by 50% stress they tend to go crazy <laughs> and um, we're only about a tenth through the mission. So if you work that out, they'll probably all be going crazy uh, long before we can get them back. Fortunately, of course, there's a remote control unit, but I don't know if in Realism Overhaul it has the Kerbalism feature where they start breaking things when they go crazy. So there's that problem. So I'm a little bit worried about the stress situation, which is weird because as you can see, living space is ideal, comfort is modest. Um, it had said that they had, you know, a long time before they needed, uh, you know, the habitat would satisfy them for a very long time in the VAB, but uh, apparently not so much. I mean, uh, you know, if they're going to get all stressed this early, I don't know what to do about that, to be honest. Um, we have a treadmill in the thing that they could de-stress with, but I don't know if they're using it. Uh, food and oxygen are what where we expect them to be basically uh, of course water is getting recycled so we don't have to worry too much about that yet uh, nitrogen i swear the consumption seems faster than indicated by this but um, if we have seven years we have seven years but just make a note it said we had seven years okay so if it turns out that it's getting tight when we get back we'll have to watch out for that and reassess how much we trust that lithium hydroxide is great of course so, yeah, um, we're pretty good on all those vitals except for the stress, I think. And I don't really understand what's going on there. Incidentally, I uh, throttled the reactor on board that thing uh, so that we make sure to dissipate the waste heat properly. And it's down to 50%. Uh, depending on the orientation of the sun, I think, it needs sometimes to go down to 40%. So, yeah, but I'm managing the waste heat like that. And uh, here we are. We probably ought to turn this. Uh, well, I'll turn this during the burn because the solar panels aren't facing the sun properly, of course. 
They seem to be catching some sunlight or I have some supplementary panel. Anyway, I'll conclude this and show you the conclusion. It's going to take a little bit of time with the RCS. Okay, well, our tugs correction seems to be complete. We'll leave it there. And um, let's see, our orientation is okay with respect to the sun. I might want to rotate that a little bit more because eventually we'll get further along in our orbit and the sun's location will be different. But I mean, technically, oh, geez, I left it turning. Oh, well, okay, keep turning, keep, keep, keep turning. Okay, now stabilize. I mean, uh, though it should be keeping uh, relative rotation to the sun. Let's make sure it's doing that. I don't know why there are two suns, but okay. One of them must be right. Okay, so yeah, we can just add an alarm when we get into Mars SOI. Uh, stop moving. <laughs> okay, and uh, that should be okay, hopefully. All right, as long as it stops wiggling. Okay, so Mars Super Lander that was launched on a Cassei rocket, so that's the one full of fuel, is up next as soon as this is it. Okay, it's uh, basically stopped wiggling as far as persistent rotation is concerned. All right, on to that. Okay, so here's the correction for Mars Super Lander on the Cassei rocket. Still a pretty heavy mass, though most of that's dry mass. Well, not most of it, but a lot of it's dry mass of the spent stage here, which we're just using its RCS to complete this. Um, though apparently not anymore. Did I run out of RCS there? Hold on. Um, oh yeah, it has methane oxygen RCS, so it's done basically. All right, uh, we might as well let it go because it's just causing problems for the rest of everything, I think. I'm not going to use its main engine for anything. So, uh, well, let's just see. Spacebar is good. I think spacebar will be fine. Okay. Separation. Oh, batteries are getting low? Well, I guess its batteries are a little bit low right now. Uh, once again, Kerbalism wiped out the batteries, even though it had the huge solar panels, but it's recharging. Okay, um, we'll need the downward facing RCS on here. There is downward facing RCS on here somewhere, right? Hmm. Apparently not. I seem to have forgotten something fairly fundamental here. Because, of course, my own lander stage has the RCS built in, but this does not. Okay, I really don't want to use these engines, but we might have to use the engines to complete this burn. But how do we settle the fuel down? I think I made a mistake in how I built this. <laughs> okay, um, I want to clear off that stage first. Uh, oh, that's the other super lander, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, I needed RCS down here. And I forgot that because my own lander stage has RCS built in. This is a problem. And, well, I mean, this RCS up here at least uses methane and oxygen, and we have a lot of that. So that's good. So we're not short of RCS, but basically we have to point retrograde right now. And boy, does it not like turning. I could definitely have used more RCS on here. It's going to be tough to control this. It's twice as heavy as my regular lander stage, too, so... Because it's carrying the ISRU and all that business. Well, basically, we are slowly pushing away from that stage. Very, very slowly. And in the process, getting closer to Mars very, very slowly. 
Okay, we've got a good polar approach. We need that in order to hit the areas with ore. And uh, we'll take this for now, even though it's a little bit high. And we'll correct that once we get there. So we'll just put in the node at the start of Mars SOI. And that will take us down into the atmosphere once we get there. So at that alarm, make sure that we are still oriented so that we get some sunlight. Uh, well, that looks like pretty good sun on the solar panels. Yes, yes it is. So we can use SAS and check per uh, persistent rotation is fine. And this should be good to go. All right, the other Mars Superlander, which is much lighter than this and uh, has the Sagitta upper stage, which is handy. Okay, so I've completed the burn with uh, this Mars Superlander and we have got it in a high polarish orbit here and it's pretty darn high but it still should be correctable inside the SOI with minimal delta V and uh, in fact I'll just check that right now yeah it's about at most 20 meters per second so I'll, I'll just keep this and we'll add that alarm and it'll be ready to go in 105 days when we get to Mars okay Let's keep chugging along. Next up is the big Supply Vessel 1. And for Supply Vessel 1, of course, we are using the ion engines to do the correction. And that actually takes less time because we can use time warp. So, well, I mean, more time in game, though actually not too bad, it looks like. Not too bad. Still more than an hour, but you know. And it's really only correcting our approach a little bit. You can see it was already encountering Mars. We just want to get it into a more Phobos Deimos like orbit or approach. Oh, it's a little bit closer to Mars than I was planning, but okay. And yeah, we'll have to bring that out, but that shouldn't be a problem. And that's about right there. We'll probably make some corrections as we capture in that case, but we'll have a maneuver there. We really should plot a maneuver well ahead, just like we did for the Mars Transfer Vehicle 2. We should have a maneuver outside so they can start boosting up before it actually gets there. I'm sure it has enough methane and oxygen to handle the capture. I mean, the capture is only like a thousand meters per second. Let's verify that. Now, of course, here we're very close to Mars, and this would not be right, but generally speaking, it seems quite doable there. I'm sure it's more than that 750 we just saw. So that's probably about 10 days ahead, that maneuver there. And let me see if I can do something to help it out. I don't know. Okay, so I've got a maneuver here in 102 days, which is about two weeks before we actually arrive at Mars periapsis. That costs 500 meters per second, and it'll bring the actual capture requirement down. Uh, well, that was a little bit too far. Uh, to about, well, under 500 meters per second, it'll bring it down to. It's a fair trade-off since we can do this burn with the ion engines. And we can also, we also bring our periapsis up to a safer level. So we'll have this maneuver done first. And we've got that plotted. All right, on to Mars Tug 3, but uh, we'll just have a peek at our grand Mars supply vessel first in all its chunkiness. Okay, final parts of the long RCS burn for this correction with Mars Tug 3. Uh, yes, this is Mars Tug 3. We're doing the burn a little bit early, though. Uh, a little bit high there, but we'll correct that once we get in. Add maneuver. Add alarm. Gotta make sure we stick to having 11 alarms here. Good. And otherwise we're gonna be missing something, and that's not gonna be good. And uh, there it is. Just a little tug, of course. Oriented properly, SAS is on. We should have toggle persistent rotation. I don't know why there are two suns though. 
And uh, I guess there's always a slot for the sun and then a slot for whatever SOI we're in. So I guess that's the reason. Okay, so anyway, there, there's that. And we'll just keep the stage along for the further RCS correction that we need to do when we enter Mars SOI. Um, it really doesn't need a whole lot of delta V for that, and we're definitely not using this engine. Okay, so three more to go. We've got the Phobos Superlander, Packrat, and then a quest module for our station in orbit around Mars. You forgot about that, didn't you? We do have a station around Mars, so we want to have a way for Kerbals to get in and out of it. Okay, here we are with the Phobos Superlander about to complete the correction, which is the longest one so far. It's like 46 meters per second. And it's been a long time with the RCS thrusters, but here we are. It is getting to the point where it will complete it, thankfully. Okay, all right, that's good enough. Okay, and then add that maneuver. This one might be coming in first. And so we'll add that alarm, 73 days. And this one's done, which means that we've got two more to go. And then next time we'll be focusing on arrivals. Well, we'll be starting off with the pre-SOI ion engine burns, maybe. No, actually, we'll probably have some arrivals first and then the pre-Mars uh, SOI ion engine burns for Supply Vessel 1 and MTV 2. In the midst, that's gonna be very complicated. It's gonna be, it's gonna be pretty darn complicated. Anyway, on to the pack rat. Okay, the pack rat rover is uh, well, it's getting further away. Maybe we should just do the rest when we. Well, no, no, it's fine. Maybe it's just wiggling a bit. Um, well, let's try and get as much of the inclination bit done as possible. All right, that, that's good enough. Okay, so that is another mission ready to go, arriving at Mars properly with an alarm. And it looks like this now. Oop, once this pops up, there we go. Um, we could roll it so that the soul, I mean, it's got, the pack rat has uh, RTG in the back. Um, not a uh, RO configured RTG, mind you. It's work in progress. I made the configuration for the Pack Rat rover, so it doesn't have the um, what you call it, plutonium and all up there. But we can roll so that the solar panels also face the sun, and we can leave that. Which means that we're on to our final mission that we have to do a mid-course correction for Mars Quest Module Probe. I should probably just rename that Mars Quest Module so that it's not. Probe. Probe, I always think, is something that we need to delete, uh, some sort of uh, debris or something. Anyway, we'll go to it. Okay, so this is the quest module, but of course it's also got the station control module, so it's actually got pretty powerful RCS thrusters because of that, plus a reaction wheel. So all this is going to be attached to the station, including, unfortunately, these ED5 packs we need to help uh, capture us into orbit around Mars. Obviously, this doesn't have a heat shield to do that with. Uh, it's uh, fuel is locked. At, no, it's fuel is not locked. We just turned off the engines. Hopefully, you'll have enough fuel when we get there. But anyway, this one's probably the quickest thing to do its uh, mid-course adjustment. Because of the powerful RCS thrusters in relation to the vessel mass, which is still 20 tons. I mean, it's not light. It's got the water recycler and everything. Okay, there we go, very nice. And so that that's pretty high up, but then again, there's a station module. We actually have to rendezvous with the station. So um, Pioneer Station Module is what we want. And so that's uh, 0.8 degrees, it's not bad. And it's got a low periapsis just outside the atmosphere and a really high apoapsis. So we have a range of possibilities as far as our capture altitude. About 107 days for the node. Add that alarm, make sure we've got the right number of alarms so that everything's accounted for. 11 alarms. And there we are. So we've got all of our missions properly situated and next time they will be arriving. So, well, it should be fun. <laughs> and uh, 
you know, I'll try and get more videos done a little bit quicker, especially with the Thanksgiving break coming up. And uh, the thing is, I'm actually also trying to learn Unity to make a game. Uh, so that's taking up some of my time. It is Mars related. But uh, yeah, anyway, that's for another time. With that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.